we can just have a bit of a conversation and then see where it goes, okay? We were talking about the trickster. Yeah. And what the role of the trickster is. And obviously there's a, a good trickster and a bad trickster, right? And yes. And more generally, the, the role of the fool. And I've been reading learning recently about the existence of a Christian archetype, the fool for Christ. And mm -hmm. uh, I've been reading the Wikipedia page and I could relate existing character, existing people who, who lived uh, during history and also fictional characters, which I liked and I identified with. Okay, and, could you uh, give me some examples? It's Fool for Christ, that's a Wikipedia page? Yes, I'm going, I'm, I haven't opened, so I, I can uh, copy can... the link uh, into the chat if you okay, want. Okay, terrific, that would be great. So we can talk about the, the role of the Fool archetype in general, and talk after this about a more precise archetype, which is Christian uh, f foolishness for Christ. To Mercurius and the, mm. the Mercury archetype, right? Because the fool is bringing in things that others don't see, right? The fool who's making you laugh, as I was mentioning, Bernard Shaw saying, you have to make them laugh, otherwise they'll kill you. <laughs> and, yes. and, was, and that was much, that was very much the case in earlier times, right? When things were ruled absolutely and they would execute you if they got mad at you, right? Later on, we can criticize our leaders, but in those days, it was only the fool that could criticize the leader, right? Yes, it's very well shown uh, in uh, Dostoevsky, the idiot, uh, where mm -hmm. the Prince Mishkin, uh, people say that he's an idiot because he doesn't behave like other people. Mm -hmm. He looks like a naive person who wants to see a good in everyone and everything. But uh, he says things which are very deep and which in, he knows intuitively without having to learn them at school. Mm -hmm. And there is a, an important scene in which he explained this. He says that he's very much aware that people think he's uh, an idiot and strange, <laughs> and, and uh, he's very much aware of it. What causes him pain is that he, he knows of, ver of very deep uh, truths, but he doesn't have the right word to, ex to express them. Right, okay. And uh, he always sounds ridiculous, so he, he doesn't feel, he feels that he, ha he has this burden of this very deep truth that he has to, to share with the rest of humanity, but right. he feels unworthy of it because he makes, he makes them sound ridiculous. Right, and of course, this is this is what Jesus Christ was doing, right? He was yeah. he was fishing things out, up out of the unconscious, so he became he and his disciples became fishers of men, and they were telling truths that were in the deep unconscious that others didn't see yet. And. and Probably people who are different from others because they have a disability, like Prince Mishkin, he was epileptic, and other characters who are less able to, to be uh, socially uh, integrated are more in touch with the unconscious, and they, are, they may be more chosen to play this role of messenger. <laughs> This is a subject which, a subject of the fool is very important to me because of the social implications that it has. Before, uh, people who were different from the norm, they used to play a different role in society than now. Now, you would say that these people has this uh, uh, diagnosis system this condition, this uh, in the DSM, 
And uh, we are going to, if some of them are going to be given medication or others, they would have sessions with a psychologist to learn social skills or to, to become more normal and integrated in society. And, uh, and I, I just watched the very uh, provoking movie, The Joker, today. And mm -hmm. they are very, uh, I, th I think it was very interesting because they, one of the lines is that he says that uh, people who, are, who have a disability, uh, society pressures them to act as if they have, have hadn't. Right. And, uh, or at least they, f they feel that society is doing that. But they, they have people telling them, uh, don't act this way. Uh, people are giving advice, unsolicited advice to someone who is not acting the same way as, uh, he's not, who is not behaving the same way as other people. They are, uh, others are going to be disturbed by this and they are going to give advice. You shouldn't talk like this or you shouldn't. Uh, walk like this, dress like this. You should. Uh, and uh, what they what this says is that you should uh, be more uh, normal. Should be less like you. Well, I'm sure that is true, but it's also just true of everybody in society. I mean, don't yes. don't parents try to straighten up their children all the time and make them toe the mark kind of thing. <laughs> are you, yes. Are you, uh, go ahead. Yes, I think it's something which is, which can be applied to everyone. And I think it's a problem uh, to everyone because it's one of the reasons why we form a big shadow right. in our society because there are many behaviors which are not accepted. As a consequence, you have people who when they are young, they catch themselves from part of them which are not accepted by society and by their, their parents. Mm -hmm. And they, they are identify with their persona very much. And they, right. they are this uh, uh, completely uh, split uh, personalities. <laughs> yes. One of the things that came to mind when you were saying that is one of the problems we have in society general, and I think it's in human society generally, is when there is a perfectionist father, typically it's a father who's a perfectionist, and he can become abusive of his children uh, because they aren't doing things exactly as he expects them to do. I was fortunate because my father never told me anything that I should do. <laughs> Basically, I mean, well, I mean, he did, he did correct me a few times, of course, but but in terms of um, how I should live my life, he never did. And so, even though he was a naval officer, he never suggested to me that I go in the military, for example. And so, and I don't know that he was very happy when I did, and especially when I went in the Marines, but he, he just took it. My sister ran away from home during, well, in 1968, after the Chicago riots that were at the Democratic National Con Convention that year. She, she's had a very troubled life ever since, and so I kind of consider her a, uh, a casualty of the Vietnam War, but she, while she was disappeared at the beginning, we didn't even know where she was for a month when she, uh, because she went to the UK. When she emerged, or before she emerged, I said to my father, he was sounding very calm, cool, and collected on the telephone. I said, Dad, aren't you worried about this? And he says, yeah, I'm worried about it. I broke my finger worrying. And apparently, he was gesturing at the table, and he, he slammed it down on the table and broke his finger. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, are you familiar with uh, 
a journal that was here in America for many years called Mad Magazine? No. No. Okay. Well, there, there was this journal, Mad Magazine. I'm going to just share the chief character for Mad, whose name is Alfred E. Newman. And so there he is. Various oh, I, I know uh, this. Uh, I may have seen this. Yeah, picture. you probably saw it at some point. But here, when I was like in the eighth grade and onward, this was a fixture in American society for like 30 years. And so Alfred E. Newman was also a trickster, and, and Mad Magazine was literally mad. I mean, it was, it was, it was like the, the fool magazine who, who was making us laugh about our, ourselves, really. And there was, there was always a, a column called Spy versus Spy, and it was always the Russians, and there was a spy who wore a white hat and white cloak and a and an evil spy that wore a black hat and a black coat. They went on and on about it. And, you know, we still have that stuff going on. I digress and interrupted your chain of thought. So Mishkin, anyway, Mishkin, well, tell me about Mishkin and, and the um, and the Fool for Christ a little bit more. Mishkin. Uh, uh, Mishkin. Yeah, Prince, Prince Mishkin, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I want I wanted to uh, uh, to say that uh, the role of the fool in society changed because of it has been more you know it's more in the medical um, uh, system which is taking care of pe of people who who, do, who struggle to fit in. Mm -hmm. in uh, society whereas before the the fool has a, a very special role in society which was to um, there was this role of like i said of the, uh, in christianity of the uh, fool for christ once worldly possessions upon joining a monastic order or deliberately Floating society's convention to serve a religious purpose, particularly of Christianity. Such individuals have historically been known as both holy fools or, and blessed fools. The term fool connotes what is perceived as feeble mindedness, and blessed or holy refers to innocence in the eyes of God. The terms fools for Christ derive from the writing of St. Paul. These des desert fathers and other saints act the part of holy fools, as have the Euro DV uh, or Euro. Dov I can't pronounce it. It's yeah, East, Eastern Orthodox. Eastern, so yes. Yeah. Fools for Christ often employ shocking and unconventional behavior to challenge accepted norms, deliver prophecies, or to mask their piety. Parallels, parallels for this type of behavior exist in non-Christian traditions as well. The Avaduta Sanskrit, for example, the Islamic tradition of Kalandaria, and Mala... <laughs> Mala Mala Matia, yeah. Sufism. In Sufism, and, yeah. And other crazy wise mystics display similar traits. Nazreddin or the Sufis is also an example. And it goes as far as uh, some uh, people said that uh, Jesus Christ himself was uh, uh, playing the holy fool uh, archetype. Uh -huh. Right, and and of course, there's a a big tradition in Hinduism where I think they are called sitas, give up everything and just beg by, beg in the street. All they have is a loin cloth and a begging bowl. And even the Buddha tried it for a period of years, maybe five years, and he became extremely thin. There's a famous jade statue 
of the fasting Buddha in the Lahore Museum. And I actually went to the Lahore Museum and took a picture of it, but I, I misplaced it. I don't know where it is anymore. Yes, I wanted to say that I've read as well people saying that the shamans in uh, American in Indian uh, tribes, right. uh, if they were in a occidental Western society, they would be considered as mentally disabled people, and uh, <laughs> and uh, they would lose their societal role that they have because yeah. of their their mystics. Right, they become mystri- mystics, and um, they become mystics because they almost kill themselves, basically, I think. They, they go out and, and fast until they can see their bones or something like that. I did a reading about this recently. I was referring to this image from... Uh, Trum and the soul, and this image is a, a whalebone carving, and this is a mystic whose one eye looks out outwardly and one eye looks inwardly, and it's called the storyteller. He he tells stories to bring people along, but basically what he's trying to do is bring people into into more consciousness. It- it also makes me think about the singer from the Radiohead uh, band uh, because he has his eyes almost closed for a long time before he got surgery. And one of the, their most famous songs is Creep. So he talks things about being a mis- misfit in society. I can't find my own picture of the fasting Buddha, but I just found one on the internet. For you here, here he is. So can oh. you see? Can you see that? Okay. Yes. So this is the fasting Buddha who had given oh. up everything, and because he's seeking enlightenment, of course, and he makes himself so weak that he realizes that that fasting and giving up everything wasn't the answer, and so then he stopped fasting. He looks like a woman. <laughs> well, uh, I thought it was a, an old lady with, with a... <laughs> yeah, he looks like an old lady, but I, actually he's, he doesn't really have breasts, but, uh, but he's down to being a skeleton. And this, I think the year of this is about 200 AD, if I recall correctly. This would be somebody that's a fool for Christ and he's given up everything. I mean, this is Buddhism, but the same idea is, is present. But the Buddha, as on his path to enlightenment, realized that giving up everything wasn't the answer. And so he had to go back to eating. As, as we talk about this, I have here a, cr- a crucifix. Uh-huh. Uh, which is the, the one which, uh, before which St. Francis of Assisi uh, prayed uh-huh. uh, when he was young to ask uh, Jesus what was his calling. I see. And St. Francis of Assisi is an example of a holy fool who gave up his possessions. <laughs> and uh, he did this because he heard the gospel of the rich young man who gave up, who Jesus told him to, to uh, give everything he had and he couldn't do it. And uh, St. Francis uh, said that uh, he could do it. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, and uh, when he prayed before, before this crucifix, he, mm-hmm. he had a vision who told him to rebuild uh, the the church, and he didn't understand. He thought it was the church of his uh, uh, hometown, oh. but actually, uh, he uh, he was his calling was to rebuild the 
Christian Catholic Church. The faith itself. Yes. Where where does this cross appear? I've I've um, I've seen a replica of it because the real one uh, was in another church, but I went to Assisi. That's why uh, mm -hmm. I I bought this because it made me remember my travel uh, uh -huh. in Assisi. So and, it's uh, it's in Italy, is that right? Italy, yes. Yeah, and um, it's really beautiful. Uh, this city. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, I, I'll tell you a little personal story about that. I I had an uncle who recently died at the age of 91, but he was a Franciscan brother. Mm. And so he, um, he and his brother were dropped off by his mother at a Fr Franciscan monastery in New York City when he was 11 years old. Okay, he was abandoned by his actual mother. And so he and his two-year younger brother were actually just given to the Franciscans. And so he went through the whole rigmarole of being a Franciscan and Franciscan brother. Uh, he ultimately earned a PhD in psychology and became... Uh, the vice president of St. Francis College in New York City. But then, at the age of 44, he won a Fulbright scholarship. And when he won that scholarship, he had to get exempted from his vows for one year in order to accept that scholarship. And so he... he you know, renounced his vows, but it always intended to go back. And um, he went to India. And in India, he got horribly ill and probably looked something like the fasting Buddha at some point in that time um, with dysentery. And so ultimately, he was metafact to Kenya, where there was a... Uh, a convent of nuns who could nurse him back to health. So he was nursed back to health over a two or three month period. And while, while he was being nursed back to health, he was thinking about my aunt, who was my mother's sister. And she was my mother's older sister. She had a PhD in psychology and she was the Dean of Women at Penn State University. And <laughs> So he had been with her at a conference and they were neither one had been married and both were 44 years old. So while he was recovering, he went and married her. Okay. <laughs> so long story, but anyway, so he ended up in where she was working in Penn state. And then ultimately they moved to, Southern California to La Jolla, which is a very high flutin' town where my, my mother's sister became the head of the Girl Scouts of America, uh, at least, I don't know if it was for the whole country or only for that district, but in any case, she had a big role in the Boys Girl Scouts of America. And so my uncle never went back to the Franciscans. And ultimately, the two of them had, and they never had children, of course, because they were already late in life. And so they had a house that was on the cliff in La Jolla overlooking the Pacific Ocean. So it had beautiful views of, of uh, sunrise, sunsets every day. And there was a, a pool there, a pool in their house that was outside. And so one day, I think I was on my way to Vietnam or on my way back from Vietnam, I forget which. He and I are in the pool and we both have a drink. And he, he says, you know, Skip, I owed this to myself. And so that's kind of his shadow coming through when he made that statement to me that he, he owed himself to be kind to himself. and have now this beautiful place because he literally lived in a cell for uh, 30 years 
and didn't experience the things that young men experience after age 13 until he got, he happened to find my aunt who was his age and also unmarried. And so that they had a long marriage together. They were very happy together for about 30 years. And ultimately my aunt was killed in an auto accident. But anyway, he was, he had an interesting experience as a Franciscan. So you, you triggered my, my story. I apologize, but you're looking tired now. Yeah. <laughs> what I wanted to say is that St. Francis had other uh, traits of the fool in the sense that uh, he talked to animals. Ah, yes. I remember um, that. And uh, he's very much uh, an inspir inspiration for uh, the current Pope who chose his uh, name as Pope because of him. Also, the ecologist movements are inspired by St. Francis because he was close to, he appreciated nature and animals. Uh -huh. And... Uh, this was not common in Christianity at his uh, period of time. Right, right. Wait, do you remember what years he was? Uh, I think it's it was in the Middle Ages. Uh, Middle Ages, yeah. Tw the tw tw 12th century. Well, of course, the the archetype of Mercurius, both, both the good side and the bad side, dark side of Mercurius, has always been what you know he was a roman god in the name of mercury right meaning that mercury was the god who went into the underworld to bring things back to people in consciousness to bring people from the under from the unconscious bring things up into consciousness and so he was the one who went into Hades and saved Persephone, among other, among other things that he did. And so his role was always kind of like the fool, it, it, which is to make people more conscious of the things in their lives. And uh, of course, our, our president, currently is is a trickster figure a mercurius figure uh for better or for worse because he by behaving the way he does which is contrary to almost all the norms that we're used to in the united states right what he is doing is making us aware of you know flaws in our own system and and in our way of picking our president and our ways of defending ourselves from uh, bad actors, not only the Russians, but uh, there are, you know, obviously at the minimum, there are Iranian hackers and uh, North Korean hackers who are trying to do things with our systems as well. And it's a very serious issue because they can shut down our power grid and things like that. So we have to be aware of these tricksters that are that are challenging our systems and including our electoral system, obviously, because that's the big political issue right now. But but these actors around the world, including non state actors, are very dangerous to both France and the United States. And as I understand it, the North Koreans have a major hacker operation in Mongolia. And so if, if the United States wanted to retaliate against North Korean hacking, we would have to attack uh, China, which, would, which wouldn't be good. <laughs> uh, and, and so it, it's a it's a big global issue in terms of what a trickster type can do to us in our society today. Um, 
yes, yes, this is the role of uh, of the trickster is uh, when there is a, an ap apparent order, uh, things seem to go well in the surface, they but are stuck and we they, they are dark things that we don't want to see so we hide them and uh, we we get stuck and we don't change things that need to change and then the trickster is there to uh, show the dark things that we don't want to sh to see and right. uh, to uh, provoke chaos in order to forces us to force us to to change to transform yeah, to have a rebirth. To right. have, I, yes. Yeah, I was I was watching uh, Jordan Peterson video the other day, and he was talking about the fact that in the Bible there are six iterations of what happens, which is that first you have chaos, and then people come in and put order on the chaos, so you get a bit of a civilization going, and then uh, the order becomes corrupt. And then the corruption leads to a collapse, and that brings chaos back. It's a cycle, <laughs> and that brings chaos back, and then uh, a new order emerges out of the old chaos. And so we're, we're definitely seeing that in the United States right now, and I'm not sure how long it will take. I mean, if we think about nazi germany in the middle of the last century the order that emerged out of the chaos of world war one was obviously fascism which took 23 years to work out of the system in a very bloody way obviously from 1923 to 1945 or 1922 or three to 22 years, and of course, Adolf Hitler was a kind of trickster too. He was a visionary, a, a shaman. He was a shamanic type of person, uh, but he was able to see things that others didn't see, and he created this fascist state that only could be destroyed by destroying everything. So at the end of World War II, Nazi Germany. Germany itself was completely flattened. I, mean, I think much of France was also. France may have survived a bit better in terms of facilities and so on. I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know what damage was done to Paris, for example. Uh, yes, the the city where my grandparents lived was completely destroyed. As a result of that trickster who, you know, led a psychic epidemic through the German population. As a result of that, all the crackery was broken, and we French and German people had to start again. And, of course, many Americans lost their lives, too, but nothing like the Germans or the French. You know, the same was true of World War One. Yes, and uh, as, uh, as people who study Jung, we should understand that these things happen on the the outside because we we haven't uh, dealt with it in in the inside internally, right? Internally, right? And, and uh, yeah. And Jung was very conscious about the fact that Americans are extremely extroverted, so most of you know. Americans are very much keeping up with the Joneses and oh you you have a you have a Lexus well I have a Mercedes or whatever it is you know and of course uh, Germans are like that or you know all Germans want to have a Mercedes so they they think they have a better situation than their brothers in some way perhaps i was quite amazed when i went to germany the first time and found that the taxis were <laughs> mercedes i go wow <laughs> we don't have we don't have taxis like that in the u.s you know we have clunky old fords <laughs> so yeah it's an important issue now 
we ought to t talk about the Quixote movie, the movie, um, the man who killed Don Quixote and the, and the Joker also, because I appreciate your thoughts on, on those. I mean, the, que the question is, and it, it's a very interesting question because it's, it's all encompassing in, in a way is, you know, from the point of view of who, are we talking about and where the twick trickster is? Because as you pointed out, the director took 17 years to make that movie. Yes. And, and so he was, he was running into roadblocks everywhere somehow. And, and so the question is, what are you seeing in that? Not, so there's not only the, the trickster, of the director himself and what he was doing, but also, you know, what, what the Adam driver, uh, role was doing. Yes. Um, there, there is a, there was a kind of mal malediction. How do you say this in English? Uh, malediction. Curse. Curse. Yes. Curse on the movie. And uh, it's it's strange because it's as if a strict uh, wanted to prevent the movie to to come out. Right. Uh, and and uh, yes. <laughs> and in a way, but in a way, the director himself was a trickster because he's using the the legend of Don Quixote to attract uh, people to be interested in his movie. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, Don Quixote, of course, is a full trickster archetype. <laughs> right. And what we have to, I don't know if, uh, if we can talk about the end for people who haven't seen the movie, but when it's what the, the, the message, I can say the message of the end without giving the, the details of what happens exactly, mm -hmm. but the message is that Don Quixote is not a physical person. It's a, it's a, it's a spirit which can pos take possession of us. Yeah, he's, he's a more... <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. And it's a spirit which makes us want to be a, a, grand, uh, a grand person who uh, ac accomplish... Uh, great acts of uh, bravery or of bravery yeah. and uh, and so it's the idealistic impulse in people yeah. the impulse to be the hero the impulse to be the hero when uh, when probably most of us can't be yes but it, actually th this impulse is quite dormant uh, today it's quite uh, uh, low in most people and that's why this character is is funny in today's society because i think nietzsche's prediction about the last man may have uh, come true the okay. fact that we what was it, what was his prediction because i don't i have it it's uh, in that this this book that zarathustra oh um, zarathustra okay there is a he, he talks about the last man who right. seeks comfort and uh, wants uh, happiness and uh, do everything to avoid pain. And uh, he pre it's a kind of prediction of uh, what man could uh, become. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it seems to be uh, well describing the state of mind of people living in uh, rich uh, countries uh, today. I guess I have to read Zarathustra again. Uh, the, the images that stick out in my mind, like the rope dancer was one, but at the end where uh, the man goes into the, I think he goes into a cave and he finds, he finds all these animals worshiping. Yes, and it's funny because it's the four animals from the Ezekiel uh, vision. 
<laughs> from, from which vision now? Yeah. You know, we've been talking about uh, in uh, the advanced uh, reading group sessions, we've been talking about Ezekiel vision. Oh, with the, okay. The three animals and the human. Uh, right. And yeah. uh, it, it's funny that uh, Nietzsche is using this uh, image as well. Because ah. uh, he says God is dead, but uh, he's still talking about God. <laughs> yeah, and I never, uh, I never put that together before, but that's interesting. I'm going to have to go back and reread Zarathustra, I guess. I, yes, I, I think Jung may have explained all this because he, he we, there is a huge, huge book about uh, the book Zarathustra. Oh yeah, I have yeah. it in uh, electronic uh, uh, format, but I haven't taken the time to, to read it. <laughs> right. Well, well, Jung gave, what, 89 lectures or something on thus big Zarathustra. So there were, mm. so the book itself, the book that Nietzsche wrote was only 200 pages, but the, but the lectures run to about, what, 1,700 pages, or something like that. So the, the reason I, I talked about this was uh, to talk about the, the last man and how a Don Quixote uh, character contrasts to, to this uh, character of the last man which represents the everyday modern man who is uh, not too poor and who seeks comfort and, uh, and uh, this, the kind of... So it's the same conflict as between uh, Antigone and he, her uncle, uh, Creon. Uh, there is a, a modern version of it uh, by Jean Anouilh, and they have a, a discussion where Antigone wants to, uh, I think it's to bury her, uh, is it the, her brother or her father? Yeah, those are, you're talking about the Greek tragedy, Antigone, yeah. right? Antigone, yeah, and uh, she, she. Uh, so the com the discussions between the two is that her uncle proposed to her happiness on earth uh -huh. by uh, accepting the limits inherent in uh, earthly life. I see. So, so she she advised her to appreciate the little things in life, and not to take too much risk <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, sh she she uh, she's the idealist one like don quixote and she she wants to i think he wants to i don't know if it's her brother or her father she wants to bury bury him and uh, but she will be in great danger if she, if she does it but she prefers to do it because she it's in the name of a, a value which is important to her. Right. And she also says that uh, the, the little happiness that her uncle is proposing to her is disgusting to her. I and see. she wants, she wants to, everything to be as beautiful as, she says that she wants everything to be as beautiful as when she was a child. So she wants the absolute, she wants, um, she wants that her, lo her love with uh, her, her boyfriend, her lover, to be the same always, forever and ever. And she, she wants every. So she has this thirst of the absolute, and she cannot accept the limits of of earthly existence. Yeah. So she, so she's a little bit like Don Quixote. They are Don Quixote is a delusional. People can say he's crazy. He cannot accept the world as it is, He's, he made up his own world in his head. But the question, he's at the, this character is asking, this story is asking is, who is the most crazy? Is it the person who has great values and he, who wants to who aspire to a, a life that he creates? in accordance with its values mm -hmm. or the person who who just adjusts himself to the world around him and who never become an individual 
<laughs> and boy, boy, have I ever lived that. <laughs> because the funny thing is, years ago, I, I gave up the practice of law in 1979 because I, I, in fi- I practiced for five years and I couldn't believe how corrupt it was and how, how sleazy the various other lawyers were in the community that I was working in. And so I went away from the practice of law. I really didn't like it. And I think you've sort of nailed it, that I was idealistic. But this didn't come to my mind when, you know, I was fighting, you know, the way things are in my big lawsuit that came up in 2010. And I fought this lawsuit for nine years by myself. I did it all by myself. And very early on, one of the opposing counsels says, you know, nobody ever fights us on this. And the point is that the way the law works is actually criminal. (laughs) But because the courts let them get away with it, You know, it's just the way things are and you can't change it. And so trying to change it is very idealistic and, you know, expecting you to, you know, expecting you to go to the legislature and change the law and that sort of thing is, is actually impossible as I found. Yes, but the the role of the fool is to believe in the impossible. Yes, and, well, I, I, I did that for quite a long time. <laughs> I, I even single-handedly took it to the U.S. Supreme Court. I wrote a 250-page brief. And yes, if, if the, the, the role of the full archetype is to always push the limits of the impossible. <laughs> and, and we need this. We've always need this in a, a, across history. Yes, we definitely need it. And, you know, in my case, it did have a positive result in the sense that basically what they were doing was stealing the equity I had in my home. And because I ran the case for nine years, they weren't able to take my house away from me and I was able to stay there. And, um, you know, finally it, it just got to be too much because of the things that they did. It was really horrific. And so they're going to be able to do it again, unfortunately. So we're going to have another collapse in the economy, sadly. Because after the 2008 crash, we put new laws in to control it, but now Trump and his people have thrown all those laws out again, so now there's no controls again. And so the same thing can happen again. Yes, and that's the sad lesson about the fool, is that he's not the fool, actually. (laughs) <laughs> and that that's the paradox and uh, that right. he looks like a fool uh, that's the message of maybe i can read the the sentence that saint paul said about this it's in the same wikipedia page about uh, f- foolishness for christ right uh, saint paul said for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in god's sight as it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. So the the lesson is that the people who represent uh, the fool in the eyes of the world, actually, they may be the the wisest people, and all the others who think that uh, this person is a fool, they may be crazier because they think. <laughs> They think they they are they are rational and they but they are actually possessed by archetypes and <laughs> precisely <yeah. laughs> and uh, the fools uh, the fool often knows that he's uh, he's crazy while the other they are crazier because they doesn't they don't know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that would be me. I mean, I, I knew that it was crazy what I was trying to do. I pretty much knew that I would lose my case right along, but I wanted to put it on the record so that others could see what I was talking about. And so that's what I did. Have you seen the the links to the videos I did on this back in 2015? Maybe. No, I don't think so. I'll give you these two links. The first one is a five-minute trailer kind of thing, like a preview. And then the second one, the rough cut, is a 45-minute documentary on what happened to me. Yes, I've watched documentaries about this. Uh, you have, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yes, it was uh, very shocking. <laughs> so even I'm playing the trickster in that movie intentionally by uh, putting my uniform on. In the trailer, in the last minute or two, I put my uniform on to, uh, to make a point, right? And uh, to make a point that I am trying to do something heroic, or I was trying to do something heroic. In that documentary, I was complaining about the fact that the court allowed the plaintiff to be to change all the facts in our case, changed every fact in our case, and they still wouldn't go for us, uh, for our side. So I was com already complaining about that in 2015 when that was done. And then afterward, they allowed them to change the facts three more times. So they the courts of Maryland literally allowed my opponents to change the facts and they never let me go to a, a jury. They never allowed me to actually have a trial. So it's pretty disgusting actually. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I was definitely playing the fool in that case. And have you read uh, Jean Shinoda Boland's books called Goddesses and Every Woman and Gods and Every Man. No. In those books, she describes several archetypes that apply to every woman and every man. And so everybody can recognize which archetypes mostly apply to them. Okay. And my two... Uh, Hephaestus, which is Vulcan, okay, so he's the, he's the workman that's working at his forge making things, and so I've been making things for years, right? I built companies, and then since 2010, I built my website, and since 2016, I built the YouTube channel, and so that's very much me and my archetypal style, and the other is Mercury, Mer Mercurius. And so I'm, I very much, um, because of my intuition, I tend to bring things to people's consciousness that they hadn't thought about before. And that's the role of Mercury, of course, for better, or for worse. And so that's what I do when I'm creating this YouTube channel. I'm trying to make information that has been hidden away for a century vis-a-vis -vis Jung. I'm trying to make it conscious for everyone. So anyway, <laughs> you know, I think that we've said some useful things here. It's, you know, I don't know what you think, but. Uh, I, I hope that people will, won't be confused because uh, the structure may not be clear uh, of what we wanted to say. That's our nature, isn't it? You're you're a P, right? You're a perceiving person too. Yes, but I, I had in mind a, uh, maybe a message that I wanted to express. But as the conversation goes, we we tend to 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 talk about different things. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what happens with me because I'm yes. a P. Even if you're, you may be a J because you're a. A programmer, but I, you might be more into structure than I am. Can you, in a minute or two, sort of sum up the message that you were hoping that would come? Because the tradition and teaching is 
you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So we need to tell them what we told them. Yeah, so as we, we had the discussion, it became something else. And uh, I think that what we, we told, uh, we, we introduced the, the f archetype the, the, and uh, two aspects of it, the heroic fool, maybe more than two, the heroic fool, the myst mystic fool, <laughs> the uh, trickster, who, like uh, your president, <laughs> yeah. the trickster fool. And so at the beginning we, talk about, we talked about the people who incarnate these archetypes who struggle to make themselves heard, to express the, the deep messages that they, the information that they have access to because of their intuition, they, 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 they find it hard to express it to other people. And very often these people are rejected by society. Whereas in the other traditions, or, in, or even in past centuries in Western traditions, the, the fool had a, another role uh, in society and he, he was there to deliver, to act as a bit as a prophet, to deliver messages to, uh, to, to the rest the of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the leaders. And Very we, good. And we, uh, we also find out that a very important message is maybe the fool is not the, the most crazy, but it's actually the other people who are more crazy than the fool. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> good point. Uh, and uh, that we need in a society, the fool is necessary to implement the changes that we need to implement and also to show that the king is uh, naked to show the, the dark aspects of our society. So it's, but the, it's better if the, the trickster archetype is lived with some internal work, because uh, if we don't do this internal work with the trickster, it may happen on the outside through a big, uh, catastrophes or wars or yeah you've seen the joker and you had yes yeah. it's actually people may there are a lot of uh, people who are who loved it or who hated it uh, but uh, for various reasons but to to me the impression it it gave me was it was very sad that it was very uh, about the tragedy of life uh -huh. that that's that's what i i got from it and I, it, I could relate to the feelings that were expressed and so, uh, so do you think that there was a message that the filmmakers were were trying to express through the joker what would that be yes i think there are several messages that several levels there is a, a message re related to society the problems in society mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the problem of people with uh, mental illness who are not who are rejected by society and also not only people with mental illness but the, all people who who are rejected by society who don't find their place in the world we we live in, in a society that rejects some people there was a, a a politician who in the movie who said that the people who did not succeed were clowns some people may say it's a violent movie or it's a political criticism but to me it's it's it was very very sad because it's it's the feeling of alienation i would say and uh, also the he said the characters said that he he's always always been sad since he was born and he's laughing all the time because of had 
brain damaged which made, made him laugh whereas uh, it was not his he was not especially uh, he didn't want to laugh but he still laughed without uh, and we understand that m most of the time when he laughs it means that he wants to cry instead ah. so it's a kind of laugh which is a cry yeah, uh, and I can uh, well imagine and some it happens to me sometimes that uh, I laugh but when I am sad he said that he f he thought that his life was a, a tragedy but but actually that it was a comedy that he discovered <laughs> that it was a comedy and uh, he is when he starts killing people and <laughs> and but so it's not something that we should do in our lives, of course. But no. it's, this message, I think, is important. I, I think it's, to me, it's what, it's the most important message for me as I, uh, as I see, as my uh, own experience of the movie, it's, it's the most important message is the life is tragic, but we can transform this deep sadness in face of the tragedy of life to, uh, to we can laugh about it we can transform it to and that that's something i've been able to to do in my life and uh, i think it's almost an alchemical transmutation of emotions right yeah very good i mean that, that's a terrific analysis actually and i appreciate your thoughtfulness and in, in what you've said tonight i you know the the next thing that we need to talk about which is a, another hour worth probably so we won't do it tonight is you know the new star wars movie and some of the observations you've made on star wars and how this adam driver actor how his real life may be coinciding with some of these things. I, I don't know very much of his real life. I know he's, uh, I, he's been in the Marines or <laughs> here. Well, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about that, but just as it's manifest in his, in his yes, movie I, roles. Yes, I'm, I'm actually, it's, I'm not, yes, I, I don't want to speak about the actor. But uh, what I'm interested in is is the is the story. But there, I'm curious because the last movie will it's uh, two months from now, yeah. and we are going to have the trailer on Monday. Oh, good. Okay. And uh, and and so this is going to be Rogue One or not? What, what's no, the no, no, no. It's, it's the Rise of Skywalker. It's the Rise of what? The Rise of Skywalker. Of Skywalker, okay. I think the sequel trilogy is about the conjuncture, but you have to see because uh, it's not ended yet. Right. But, uh, um, so I'm not sure how the director decided to, to end it. Yeah, that's inter that's uh, going to be very interesting because I, I, I do see the conjunctio at least hinted in what in what you've been saying and then um, yes, because in the, the two yeah. roles of of uh, what are it's Ray and what what's yes. Adam Driver and yes, I what the reason I talked about this during the sessions is that. It made me think about the the original Adam, who was both who was hermaphrodite, and uh, what was interesting is what the directors said about these two characters is that they were two halves of the protagonist. So one of them is in the dark side, and the other is in the light side. And mm -hmm. one is a man, the other is a woman. But the the man is not wholly dark. There is light in him, and the woman is not wholly uh, light. There is darkness in her as well. Yes. So they are yin and yang uh, yeah. 
yeah. and uh, I think it's the the theme of of this sacred trilogy, and uh, I think they want to uh, to correct, uh, not to correct, but to uh, expand on the message of the previous movies. The mm -hmm. previous movie was the war between good and good and evil, with the redemption of the evil character uh, in the end, because Darth Vader, uh, the father gave up his life for his son so his son forgave him but still it was well the the son uh, look he he had a confrontation with the shadow but i think it was not perfectly addressed that i think they they there is more to um there, there is still a problem with this in the original and the prequel trilogy, with, which was, which was a, a shot after the, the, the original trilogy, because in the prequel trilogy, we see how uh, this Darth Vader character became who, it, who he became. Right. So we see he was a good person before right. and that he fell to the dark side. And uh, the message that is that he, we can understand if if we can if, if we deeply think about what happens, we understand that it's because of the teachings of the Jedi that he fell to the dark side. It's because the Jedi told him to be all light side, to repress his his dark emotions, his attachment to people, his anger, his fear. And it's because of this repression that he completely... Uh, he went uh, the other way. He snapped. Yeah. He snapped back like a rubber He's, band. Yes. And I think this has to be addressed. Yeah. And I wonder if in the sequel trilogy they will explain how we can integrate our shadow in a more uh, healthy way. <laughs> it's going to be interesting because, you know... Obviously, when, when Lucas did the original Star Wars, he obviously intended it to be very mythological. But mm -hmm. I don't, he was more influenced, I think, at that time by Joseph Campbell. I don't have the impression that he had the full Jungian ideas in mind at that time. But I think that actually has evolved in him over the last 40 years so that it it's actually you're actually seeing the the evolution of his psyche and how he's sort of moved beyond yeah. beyond the mythology to the Jungian side of yeah, actually it's not him anymore who do the mm -hmm. sequel trilogy it's other directors and the sec i don't know about the the one who's doing the last movie and the first movie of this trilogy because it's the same, but the one who did the middle movie, which came out in uh, 2018, I think, it was The Last Jedi, and this uh, Ryan Johnson, his, it's his name, mm -hmm. and he, he read uh, Jung, so... Mm -hmm. He, uh, I, but uh, he received a lot of criticism because uh, some people think that uh, these movies has uh, political intent and uh, they are focused on this aspect and which, whereas I'm not very much thinking about it, I'm more interested in the symbolism. Well, of course, you can always give that criticism because our lives actually do match archetypes and and therefore if you have a story like this that's so vast and and covering so much time and development uh, you are going to touch on things that are actually happening in current events whether you like it or not it's just going to happen and, and uh, it's like religion the problem is when people make a too literal interpretation of what happens they are, it's going to make them angry because of course, we cannot apply this to directly to our everyday life. Right. The, the characters in the movie, 
for instance, Darth Vader, if he, if he was a real uh, person, people wouldn't uh, forgive him like this. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Of course, but it's not, it's not real people. They are, they have a, they are archetypes. And, yeah, uh, they're, they're complexes in all of our unconscious. <laughs> yeah, so you cannot treat them as if they were real people. Yeah, that's the thing. Do you mind if I try to edit this conversation and, and use it? Can I do that? Yes, I think you can, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me work on it. I do have one more of Nancy that I have to complete, and that's going to take me, God knows, another week or two. <laughs> I, I've watched uh, her interviews, and they were amazing. And uh, as a Christian myself, I can relate to what she's uh, saying. And Terrific. I love and, it. And and she you, had a... You think it's as powerful as we do? Yes, it's very powerful. I, I hope you'll comment on that to her yeah. on Wednesday. And, and also, I hope that you'll bring up this issue of the hermaphrodite with Adam Cabman, etc., on Wednesday, because Tim and I have been going back and forth on the idea of Adam and Eve, and I think that you know you've you've just added an important element of that which is that you know the first true human might have been a hermaphrodite or you know we're struggling with the idea and he and i have taken it very deep <laughs> i don't know i don't know if he's going to do anything with it artistically but it could be an interesting conversation on Wednesday, but I think your comments about the hermaphroditic nature of Adam and Eve. Um, yes, I think I would need to read more of uh, the woman I talked about, uh, Annick de Susanel, because she, like I said, she, she read the, the Bible in Hebrew, and she has a very different interpretation than most uh, uh, theologians have. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially about this aspect of uh, Adam and his other side. So, uh -huh. Interesting. Yes. That would, that would be good to know about. Yes. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could do all the reading that people keep recommending. Me. <laughs> <laughs> but I am working on the Hannah book. I have the Hannah book here. And uh, in this, there's a chapter on Mysterium. Mysterium Conjunctionis. So I'm I'm trying to read that chapter, and as you see, I have an old copy. I've bought used copies of all these books, so this is so yellowed. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's I want to read what Barbara Hannah has to say about Mysterium there before Wednesday, if possible. So anyway, it's been fun to talk with you about these things, and so let's have. Uh, another conversation about Star Wars as we go forward. There's no hurry, but I think, um, you know, the thing to do would be next time is for you to pull together some of the, those images that, that you've shown me in the past about that showed the images in the juxtaposition with the tarot. I think that's a very interesting insight of yours. And then we can put them on the share. I think you can share from your side too, right? So if you put... Which one of the tarot? Uh, I well, well you, at one point you and I were talking about the Star Wars movies and how yes. how certain aspects of them were, were reflective of the tarot. Ah, yes, I sent a video about this, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think you sent me some images, but if we can make some still images that then we can share during the interview, right, that you can share from your side. In other words, if you can do some screenshots that yes. explain I, your point. I've watched a video about someone who studied this, but I, I couldn't understand all that she was saying. So okay. personally, I, I don't uh, really un understand the tarot. Or Oh, okay. I, I've listening to this because I found it interesting. 
I saw and okay. uh, she and she was quoting Jung and Mysterium Conjunctionis as well. So I, I would okay. need to, to hear it again. Maybe I'll have to do that too. Then I thought I thought you had done more detailed study of it, but it's something we can talk about in connection with Star Wars because obviously the whole Star Wars saga is extremely archetypal, hugely. And yes, and uh, the the issue is now it's provoking a, a lot of conflicts on the internet. Some there are very positive. Ex aspects but also uh, other more toxic uh, aspects of the fans so <laughs> yeah well uh, you know with there was a warning years ago and that was that if you if you start studying archetypal issues it it's going to set off things in your own unconscious and obviously uh, I experienced that very strongly when I wrote my novel and when I when I read Women Who Run With the Wolves back in 1993 because uh, when I read that book, just reading the stories kicked off various archetypes and constellated them in my unconscious, which then poured out into my novel. And so when we have so much archetypal material, it does cause things to get loosened up in people's psyche, I think. You know, people 500 years ago were pretty boring compared to modern humans because, you know, they didn't have much information at that time. All they had was the church. And so they had some stories, but and they were archetypal stories, but... They didn't have all the these conflicts and various things which we now have. But anyway, I'll let you go. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Have it's, a good day. <laughs> it's been a fun conversation. Talk yes, to you it soon. Was.